Um, so thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed watching uh, Diana Gunfight and we're uh, very lucky to have director Colin Shifley here to talk about the movie with us. Um, and um, Colin, I, uh, I wanted to, to start by congratulating you. This is a very exciting, very visual, uh, fun movie. It's, uh, it's exciting to have that kind of film right now. Um, and I'm just curious to know a little bit about how you came to it. Uh, this is your third feature, right? Yeah, correct. Yep. Um, so you, you don't write your own films. So um, I'm curious how you connect with your writers. For sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for saying all that. That that is spot on. I think we're in a time that uh, some film escapism is is definitely welcomed. Um, and yeah, I kind of. Um, I mean, I want to work on all kinds of movies. I, I don't want to uh, put myself in any box when it comes to that stuff. So uh, I'm pretty open minded to to where and you know where the writers come from. All backgrounds, all different types of stories and genres. Uh, my, I got my start, uh, actually animals behind me here, that poster, uh, it's my first film, um, that I got plugged in through an actor that the writer of that film is the star of it. And so he's a writer, actor, David Desmolchin. And, uh, my first two films were written by him. Um, I have a brother, Brandon Shifley, who is a screenwriter who we're working on our stuff on the side, but I'm always looking for, you know, I love reading things and then seeing like, how do I put my stamp on it? How do I, how do we push the elements that, you know, whatever the core catalyst of why they're right, the writer is writing that uh, script or telling that story, that's where I like to, to try to pull that stuff out of it and, and accentuate it. Um, so I'm always looking anywhere, but uh, for, for Gunfight, um, Andrew and Gabe, they actually, through David Desmolchin, um, uh, they were at, you know, during the time of, uh, my first film was at South by Southwest and whatnot. And we all kind of crossed paths when they were working on uh, Ant-Man together. David's an Ant-Man. And they right. had seen, seen my first film and were like, well, what's he doing next? Because we have uh, this little baby project that's been around forever. That's uh, their passion and we need someone. And I read it thinking it was probably more in the vein of my first two films, which are very heavy, gritty, dramatic kind of uh, uh, guerrilla style films. But it was this was like this over the top, not over the top, but very uh, tongue in cheek, funny action romance you know story that i was like you know what like it deals with a lot of the themes that i love that, I, that i've already dealt with that i want to keep exploring and uh it has it's like a love letter to movies it really was this like nod to to cinema and and um i was like you know what this is something that's a it's it's a departure for me but i want to i want to explore it and and luckily they they were on board with that and, and we all kind of vibe together and and so yeah it, I never know where the next script is coming from, but um, always looking, you know, always trying to find it. So I always find it interesting when a director works with similar themes, but in sort of a different tone. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about some of the things that you feel like are uh, sort of, a con you know, continuous exploration of, of, of ideas and, and themes from your prior work. Sure. Um, well, part of me, again, if you would have, ask me any of this or if I were to talk about this 10 years ago I probably would have had a totally different answer because I, I you know we grew up kind of idolizing the filmmakers that have their body of work it's, it's not just one movie it's like kind of the themes they always explore and the way in which they do it um so I was like I want to be like that you know I can't everything's got to be a certain way and but at the same time you know I grew up loving all kinds of movies and ultimately at at you know the heart of it I want to make commercial films I want to make big commercial films that can still be nuanced and tackle, you know, either heavy subject matter or, or something uh, with a little substance. But, you know, that's that to me, that's Spielberg and, and, and Robert Zemeckis and Back, uh, Back to the Future and Star Wars and all, you know, those are the movies that inspired me subconsciously. Um, but, you know, as I've gotten older and especially with the way the industry is going and, and how there's so much more content and you gotta kind of fight to have your voice heard even more so than ever. Um, and people are always, you know, you're fighting for people's attention. It's like, well, you know, if you make the greatest movie ever and it's it's your mom and dad see it, is it the greatest movie ever? Like, you know, like how do you reach an audience? And so for me, it's like, well, what if what if you could tackle all subject matter? I want to make all genres. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated and almost angry in a way that 
I, I was, you know, always say that, why can't I see the a Tim Burton version of Saving Private Ryan? You know, like, what would that be? Mm -hmm. uh, it's so much more exciting to me than the, the you know, the standard or, or seeing Scorsese always dealing with crime or whatever. It's like, I want to see Scorsese's Star Wars. Uh, it's something you're never going to get. Or maybe, or, or, or uh, what was it like? David Lynch's Return to Return of the Jedi. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, maybe, maybe what that was was Dune, and Dune is, you know, like, you know, it is what it is. But uh, so it's like, you know, I don't know. Uh, you could probably argue that they do have their own version of those things. But for me, I really want to explore everything, and and so it's not necessarily the style. There, there, there are some stylistic elements that definitely connect all my movies, even Gunfight to the other ones. But it really, it's like the themes. It's the themes of of you know love and and uh again it's all could be cheesy stuff but that's kind of what to me why i like gunfight it's tongue in cheek in terms of it dealing with this romanticized view of the world and, and and love and and redemption and hope and peace and especially as i get older and i'm less less angsty and less edgy wanting to be edgy for the sake of being edgy and it's like no what are we really trying to explore and um so yeah it's it's a little of everything and i know it's a long-winded answer but um uh for me i don't want i don't want to be pigeonholed into any specific genre or any specific box but i definitely think you will see a a, a common thread with with the idea of love and star-crossed lovers and 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 whatnot yeah it's uh it's interesting that you say edgy for the sake of edgy because you know there are so many movie moments in this movie where when i watched it with my wife we we were sort of really touched by how like sincerely sweet the love mo like like the the love story moments were and not just between the two main characters but also the assassin and his and his wife yeah and and that's sort of like a sincerity that doesn't necessarily always you know pop up in a movie that's you know edgy yeah uh, it really does take uh confidence to to be able to have those moments of genuineness in the middle of something that's you know obviously very playful and uh, with its form and its style. Yeah. Um, so tell us, I guess, a little bit about um, mixing these two things. Uh, what is the script versus the film in terms of that balance? Did you sure. find that the script leans heavily into the ro romantic side of it? Or do you feel like that sort of was something that, you know, you worked on more once you came on board and had the actors together to make it so genuine? I think it's definitely a little both. I will say that on the page, it was there. And I feel like if that was not on the page, if that voice did not come through the romantic, the the kind of genuine sincerity to the, the core, because again, like 10 years ago, I would not even want to touch this movie with a 10 foot pole because I was so pretentious and like, I got to make art, you know, and not that this isn't like, it's like, oh, it's like dawned on me that it can be in here, just like how back in the day you could, you can watch Back to the Future and see the genuine beauty and artistic, you know, merit to it. Um, but also you can just be like, I'm also just watching a time travel movie, you know? And so it kind of, I had to do some digging into myself, but the writers, you know, especially when I met them, it's like when I met them and then could pair up our conversations in person um, with what I had read, I was like, I get it. The genuineness is there. You're telling a story from your, 20s that they wrote that they want to that they're stuck sticking with because you know we all there's a there's always a, a an audience for this we all go through those phases of wanting to romanticize the world and what we want to go do once we're out of school and want to go tackle you know the subject matter or the careers or whatever it is um so it had all that kind of the nods to all those things that i once thought and still think it was deep down it's still in me um but it's stuff that you think you've moved beyond and and so anyways it's like as I met them, I was like, they're the, the writers, Andrew and Gabe, their, their tongue in cheek nature was fully, they, they, the way it's written on the page is how they speak. So the playfulness was, was in their personalities, but more importantly, the genuine kind of um, the, the nods to all the, the romance and, and the love and the, the, the meta-ness of the story, um, the kind of the feeling numb, the, the, the idea of trying to feel something in, in, in a world that can make you so jaded. Um, I was like, wow, they're the real deal. They're not just some guys who saw a bunch of Tarantino movies or Guy Ritchie movies and wanted to mimic it, you know? Yeah, there's elements of that stuff, but it's like, it, it, it walked the line already. It was my job then to make sure that that didn't get lost. So I'm glad to hear that you guys felt that as you watched it. Um, and yeah, it was kind of like, I wanted to speak to you young generations, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, uh, re repel the, 
you know, the, the older audiences either, as cinephiles or anyone. I didn't want people to say, ah, oh, this is just a dumb, something that could be on the CW or something, nothing against anything like that. But uh, uh, you know what I mean? It, it could have just been a little more melodramatic and simple. And I was like, no, I wanted to have the flair, but uh, what I like to think that I put into it was what I put into my other two movies, which is, you know, kind of that heart and soul, the, uh, which is kind of the love, the more genuine moments between, uh, you know, even though they're out there, the, the, especially the side characters, even though they're larger than life, you know, I wanted to make sure they were still human in a way. Um, and it was, it was definitely tricky, but, uh, but I think it kind of comes through. You, you accomplish a lot with the uh, animation in the film in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, it, it covers a lot of the uh, sort of the exposition. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And then it's also very visually exciting. We talk yeah. about, um, you know, if that was from the script and how you actually came about um, deciding the style of animation and what you communicated to your animators. Sure. Well, luckily, going into it, and my background is editing. So I, I always look at everything of how it's going to be put together. And I knew that I wanted to play with all the fun French New Wave movie tropes and everything that's been used to death in every movie from split screens to narration. You know, again, it was all on the page, but I wanted to make sure we really let that shine through. Um, and it's funny because you know, the narration was there. It was all there. It, the exposition of the movie, all, all of that was supposed to be aware. We're, we're, I get it, you know, like, again, me 10 years ago would have been like, we can't use narration. We got to figure out how to say this visually, you know, but this is like, this is Ben's movie. This is how he sees his world. So of course he's going to have narration. And it's funny because, you know, when you start shooting, you have your, I had, I had this idea of the, the over the top stylistic approach that we were going to do in editing and whatnot, and how we shot it with the aggressive camera work and the freeze frames. But we actually just kind of ran out of time to get the full subplot told and the backstory told. We just couldn't get it all during principal photography. So part of me, you know, part of you kind of is filled with a little worry. How are we going to fill these gaps? But you know, you're going to figure it out. Um, and we had our game plan. But my game plan was to tackle some of that by doing getting maybe getting a little smaller crew or figuring out a way to fill that stuff in as we knew we needed it in post to be like, look, Here's what works. Maybe we don't need this, but we do need those backstory beats. We do need the setup of the movie. We need, uh, you know, some of these side plot elements. Well, we finished shooting in 2019 and COVID hit. So we're editing, you know, which was half a blessing because we got to be left alone. And then we just were locked away anyway. So we're like, well, let's keep tinkering with the movie. But we were like, I was like, great. How are we going to finish? How are we going to fill the gaps? Which was the setup of the movie. And and we knew that we were really, at this point especially, we're like, whoa, the colors are popping, the, the, the music, everything's like really popping, but what's, how do we finish? And, and it was actually Andrew, the writer, which again is a testament to their creativity and their willingness to adapt accordingly. You know, they're not stuck on exactly what's on the page. And, you know, they took what they already had and, and were like, you know, he was like, what about animation? It's like the one thing we're missing with all the movie tropes. And we're like, you know what? I think that'll work. And for me, again, the style of the movie was a grittier version of, you know, I was fresh off of the Back to the Futures and stuff, finding Goodfellas and Boogie Nights and Taxi Driver. And today's generation, I'm like, well, what are kids fresh off of? They're fresh off of these Marvel movies that kind of have a comic book. You know, I mean, there are comic books, they're, they're slick and colorful, but, you know, so I wanted to make sure we had an element of that so that these kids who are, you know, young adults who are like, well, what else is out there? What else can I find that, that has one leg in a familiar territory, but also takes some weird risks and shows them a, a different world of, of movies and what movies can be. And so to me, the, the animation uh, was kind of the icing on the cake and also the mo one of the most important, like seeing that at the very, if I were to watch this movie as a, someone who judges movies pretty hard, uh, I would be like, what is this movie? But because it starts with the animation, I feel like I would be like, oh, I get it right off the bat. That to me was what needed what it needed to set up this over the top kind of uh, character, um, tongue in cheek world, you know, stylized world. Absolutely. No, it puts you it puts you right into it. Mm -hmm. So this is your first film without David. I'm curious to know what the casting process was like. Yeah. It was trick casting, I will say, is my least favorite phase. You would think it'd be the most fun, but it's fun, obviously, to get to meet people and see everyone's perspective and, and, and start to talk to people who are responding to the material and want to add to it. 
But for me, it's so painful because one, it takes like forever to get an answer. You know, it's like three weeks goes by and you're like, they haven't even read it yet. And you're like, great. And then they'd say no. And you're like, okay, um, good thing we wasted a month. But um, at the same time, I know how integral that is to both the creative and to the getting the green light to actually have the money in the bank to do it. Um, and for me, Dave, at some point, like he literally was one of the introducing pieces of getting me to know the writers and and because they were working on Ant-Man together. And um, he, you know, was at one point going to be the bad guy, the villain. He was at one point going to be the McCool side character and he was going to play it like really interesting. And um, he was down to be involved in any way. But the way all the pieces came together, uh, he actually, when we finally did get the green light, he was uh, about to go do Suicide Squad. Yeah. which comes out soon and obviously looks amazing and cool and stylized and totally beautiful James Gunn and stuff. Um, and of course, so of course he had to go do that, which was amazing. And he went and did Dune also. So it was a bummer that we couldn't get him in it. And we were trying to figure out how we could even get him as a, a little, just a cameo to pop up at the end, maybe to marry them, be the guy, the, the officiary of the wedding to marry them or something. But it, for whatever reason, it didn't work, but I want to work with him forever. And I've known him since film school. And, 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 and like I said, he stars in, uh, in both my first two movies and he wrote them. Um, so we we're, we're constantly working on a million things together and helping each other and criticizing each other and pushing each other. And so we'll, we'll work together for sure. Again, I can't wait, but, uh, it's a bummer that he doesn't pop up in this, but, um, uh, the next one for sure. So, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, some of the choices you did make for the casting. Um, obviously, Alexandra and uh, Billy Crudup and yeah, and many uh, here are, are particularly sort of well known. Um, yeah, you know, there's it's it's exciting to see a movie where you don't necessarily have everyone in the cast, you know, bringing in a whole bunch of extra baggage from other other roles. Sure. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, I mean, for me, my my stipulation, I guess, is like I wanted people that wanted to play and wanted to be a little fearless in the role, take bold choices and, and, and do stuff that maybe they're not, you know, isn't in their wheelhouse or, or they haven't had the opportunity to do yet. Um, and I wanted people hungry for it. Like, like Diego, he, he, he just really identified with his character and wanted to bring that charm and bring a charm at, that I see. I don't know if I think he would agree with this, but that I would see in like a, like a, a Tom Cruise in risky business or, you know, something that was, you can see, he could be the, uh, a Tom Cruise, you know, he has that charisma or that, uh, that, that appeal on screen. Um, so I wanted those, that attitude and, and people like um, Alexand Alexandra, who one obviously can say so much just with her eyes, like stuff like that. Obviously, those are the simple surface level elements where I'm like, well, I can't wait to, her eyes are so piercing. She's going to be so unique to film and it, it lends itself to this kind of uh, heightened world in a way. Um, but at the same time, you know, getting to know her and seeing her as a, she's so, she's so smart and so uh, in her head, like it's almost like hard to crack what she's thinking. And that was a challenge for me, but I loved it because she's willing to step out and, and take risks and, and, and trust me in the process. But at the same time, she brought such a, a, um, a depth to it that I never, you know, I didn't know, I, I, you, you hope they have, they, you hope they can bring that or maybe they show up, do their thing. They can look cool on camera and, and, and sell the kiss and move on. But like she added like a layer, them together added this maturity. You know, this isn't, these aren't 16 year old Romeo and Juliet's. These are kind of jaded, uh, beaten by the world, kind of, you know, mopey at first, not knowing what to do with their life, oppressed by their families, um, characters that, could just be melodramatic whatever and they brought this level of 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 you know sophistication to it and and i think that is all i could ask for and of course when it comes to you like you said people they're they're like she's alex is a little more well known and travis is starting to pop up and everything and apparently everyone wants him and you know in hollywood right now he's like hot stuff and 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 i just am you know honored to um to, to have gotten to work with him and Justin and people who, what I say, wanted to go that extra mile to, to try to find like the Gary Oldman, Nicolas Cage performance mm -hmm. uh, to go, you know, really just be like, make this weird, make this your own. <laughs> so, so, so it worked. Um, so you, you were talking about not having the ability to uh, uh, 
get everything done in principal photography. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that does raise some questions of like, you know, when you're making a film like this, you have to make some sacrifices, uh, whether it's, you know, because of the schedule or because of the yeah. budget. Um, what was the most um, sort of the biggest creative challenge that you faced when you were actually in production that you had to deal with on the fly? What did you do? Um, yeah, for me, I'm all about being prepped. You know, my biggest advice is always like the movie should be done before you show up, you know, so that way you can throw it out the window if you need to, or you stick right to plan. But I've never experienced, this one was a challenge because one, there's so many moving parts and it's an ensemble piece. And, you know, you, I, we had multiple cameras and things that I wasn't, you know, that was new to me. And I, and I love that challenge. But at the same time, uh, for example, you know, there's just things that happen because it is an indie, indie film where, suddenly the money isn't there where, where you thought it would be there, you know? And it's like, well, where do we adjust it? Where do we need to make sure it's being seen on screen? But that's something new to me, you know, that's for me, it's, I'm still of that nature. And I think the move, the movie industry is shifting into this more and more because the generation's changing and the kind of factory worker, worker approach to filmmaking is being dismantled. And I, I, you know, I, I say that with respects to understanding that you stand on the shoulders of giants to make movies and it's been done. And there's a reason why certain rules and things are in place, but you also need to break all the rules. And I'm of the nature of grab the camera when you can and just start filming and see, you know, there's this and this, and we just got to make it work. You know, having a plan, but knowing you can deviate from the plan. Whereas this was just walking that line of back and forth where sometimes you just couldn't do that because you have, you know, 50 extras in a room. And there's, I keep telling the story of the, the shooting at the club. We, we all would say that the club scene is not anywhere near what we wanted it to be, both when they get to the club and when they're in the, you know, in the room, because for whatever reason, instead of a hundred extras, we had 40 extras. And for, uh, we didn't have time to, you know, Diego, our lead actor, had to get on a plane halfway through an eight-page shooting day, which was just an accidental oh, overlooked yeah. scheduling thing that was news to me the moment it, you know, the one day I thought we were ahead of schedule and we're actually on time and we're like, wow, we're going to make our day. It's like, oh, he's got to be on a flight in about two hours. And you're just like, I remember being like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to adjust to this stuff. I know how to adjust to it's raining. Let's figure this out. Or I know how to whatever. But those were things where I'm like, we've talked this over and over and over how did this happen um and it's just things that happen it's like it's you don't you know it's no one person that you need to throw under the bus or point fingers at like to me i'm like you just got to figure it out and you know our solution there is like well now we're running gun doing handheld gonna shoot this whole thing handheld and we're gonna have our writer literally the, the writer of the movie put on an outfit the Diego Ben outfit and and stand opposite and we shoot over his shoulder you know and luckily Travis was cool enough to be, you know, make it work. Wait, so you're, you're, for the club scene, you're, 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 you're saying both the large interior of the club and the specific rooms where the, the two, the two more um, intimate scenes are happening. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Both, went, both went wrong and we had about a day and a half to do that. And that was supposed to be one of the biggest set pieces of the movie. And it still is fine, you know, and it, what it forced us to, especially in post, come up with creative solutions to push the weird, you know, again, tr luckily the, the Travis and uh, Emmanuel character, Wayne and, Wayne and Barbie, they're the wild card weirdos that are, are supposed to kind of inject this random kind of uh, adrenaline into the movie and into the characters, you know, story arcs. So I'm like, you know what? That's where we lean into the wildness of how we edit the scene and how we approach it. And you know, we, we've had so many renditions of that scene. And luckily it is a, it looks like a stylized animation of its own, you know, with the reds and the, and, and all that. So we just had to push it to its fullest. Um, and luckily, you know, again, if that had happened in my other movies, you, come, you have to come up with a different solution because those movies don't rely on, on the weird craziness of editing and whatnot. And when you say you want, you want, uh you know, that the, the, the Gary Oldman performance in that moment, uh, yeah. talk a little bit about sort of the way that you work with an actor on something like that. Uh, does he just sort of give you a whole bunch of different options? Do you let him go, go crazy and sort of see where it goes, but you, you have a time frame to work within. I mean, it is, uh, it, it's the, the, the gift and the curse of, um, uh, independent, cinema is that you know yeah. you, you can take chances but then you're you're limited usually by by time and money absolutely uh and for me I'm, I'm all about my instincts as a director are always like dial it back bring it back like 
my favorite thing to do is if the line, if they, if two characters say lines to each other, and if I don't think it's working, I'll say, say it with a look, you know, those are, that's my fail safe. My, my safety net is if, if so, a line reading is just not working, it's like, yeah, you get it. You were filming it. But then the final take, I'll be like, say that with a look and you respond with a look or an act or a hand action. And then that usually is what goes into the scene or, 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 or what I end up using. Whereas this, I, I maybe went a little too far the other way where I was like, let, you know, let them loose a little, uh, let them play. But it was stuff that we had talked about enough beforehand that they always, everyone stayed within a certain uh, parameters um, when doing things. But at the same time, I kind of, with, with time restraints, may I, if I had more time, I would have been like, let's get a little more dialed back version. I kind of went big on everything, um, which is, is, you know, it is what it is. It's a choice for sure, I guess. But uh, yeah, you always want to try to get the meat in the middle somewhere and, and, and make sure you cover yourself but you can't just be willy-nilly oh, let's do every single version of the scene and a lot of times the actors don't want it they're like I, I don't think my character would do that you know like um but luckily everyone wanted to play so we, we definitely kind of all supported each other in that way to push ourselves but for me it was about alex and diego staying the gra as grounded as they could be within with within a reason of this world mm -hmm. uh, maybe not as grounded as my other films but then being the heart and core a uh, heart and uh, soul of the core of the the movie and then even having the nice moments with like Wayne and Barbie um by themselves you know when they're in the truck together uh they have these little sentimental you know uh touching moments too and and knowing that our actors were good enough to you know to 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 dial it down or to bring it up um in either direction when they needed to um but I usually my instincts are always less is more always but this that's why this movie was definitely a challenge for me there's also a decent amount of um, playing around with, uh, uh, I guess, sort of the, the temporal structure of the film. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious how much of that was something that you just discovered while you were editing it versus strictly how you were, how it was written. Um, it's definitely, again, kind of on the page in so many words. I don't think it was ever referred to. Uh, they did mention like freeze frames and stuff in the script. And again, I debated whether I wanted that or not or how much we lean, leaned into that stuff. But I think a lot of that was, again, my, my, edit, my background is editing. And so I knew how I wanted it cut together as we're filming it. Um, but I, I loved that, unlike my other films, that I wanted them to feel very real. And I wouldn't necessarily have that um, resource to play in the post. I wanted it to just seem seamless. This one, I wanted it to be almost not seamless. I wanted it to be like, whoa, what, what is happening here? That almost seems like, to the point where I'm like, is this bad editing or is this just crazy risk-taking editing? That was the line we kept walking in the editing room. And I knew that I wanted that room to play. And luckily my editor, she took it 10 times further than me when it came to like split screens and things. That was, uh, most of that was her just being like, let me try something. And then I let her play for a day and then she'd suddenly show me something that I was like, this is exactly what this scene needed. Um, so it was, it was there in so many words, but I knew, I knew that a lot of it was going to be explored in post and, and, and yeah, that's what we did. You said that you, uh, you the, uh, the upside of, of having to do post in a pandemic was that you were sort of left alone for a while. Did, was there something about this process of post-production that you'd like to take into the next film that you make? Anything about working with an editor that was different that you think was beneficial? Absolutely. I think, I mean, it's a dream for someone to be like, here, here's 10 weeks, we'll leave you alone. And that's in theory what I would have gotten anyways, I guess. But more so than ever, it felt like they were just like, we don't know when this is going to end. So just keep playing with it if you want. And we were like, sometimes that's bad because you need the movie to be taken away from you. But um, but what I think what I take with me is is like we were supposed to have like a editing suite, some, you know, a nice little hookup somewhere that we drove to. And, you know, part of me wishes that I could get out of the house and go, you know, get away from the work. But I also love these moments that I never knew was a thing where I could literally roll out of bed in the middle of the night because I was thinking of a moment. That I was like, I just got to go toy with that real quick. I could literally roll out of bed and walk over to the computer, which actually was this computer. Um, and uh, and play around. And to me, I want to kind of hopefully incorporate that um, into the next project where it's like, 
maybe save money, use, use it as a perk uh, for them, save money. We don't need an editing suite. Let us just do it from home or do it from, you know, wherever. And, and then we'll send you scenes. And once we feel ready to start getting it to you, to the people who need to start giving their input, then, then do so. But, you know, that might be wishful thinking, but I know my editor and I, we worked together on the last three films and she, uh, her name's Amanda Griffin. She, um, she's working on all, she works on documentaries. She works on everything. So I love that her mindset is, make it work any way possible, whether that's the approach or the actual editing. Um, and, and yeah, I, I definitely want to carry that over as much as possible into the next one. I'll be really, really interested to hear uh, after you make your next film, how, how that process yeah. was adapted to, to post COVID, like taking best you know, practices into, into the new environment. Sure, sure. I'm hoping people are open to it. So you guys are opening in theaters? Yes, it's select theaters. Um, it's worldwide and and, and U.S. and, and domestic. Um, uh, select theaters here. It's opening on a lot of theaters in, in Russia and Australia. All these cool things. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Like 500 plus theaters, I think, uh, in Russia. Um, I think. Uh, of course, things change here and there. But um, it's been weird trying to navigate. You know, just even for Lionsgate and for everyone, has it's been a very open, transparent discussion of like. Well, where are people watching movies? Will it be ready for, you know, will, will, will people be ready to go back to theaters? And we've been gauging it based on, okay, you know, King Kong versus Godzilla did okay. And then people are going to see A Quiet Place and Fast and the Furious is doing well. But there's still those people who you just are never going to get to a theater maybe again. And, and uh, people who want to just enjoy movies on a Saturday night or Sunday night or something from the comfort of their home. Sure. You know, again, a few years, you know, 10 years ago, I would have been like, oh, no, it's got to be theaters. But now I'm like, like I was saying, like, if, if, if you're the more you can reach, if, if people w love watching movies like that, I will always be an advocate for go to the theaters, watch it with a group of people, because that's so much more effective, um, that communal experience. But I understand, like, I understand that it's the world's changing. And, and I'm just grateful that it will be on Apple TV. It will be on um uh you know amazon prime and all all the platforms that uh, at your own comfort you can watch um but i obviously will always be like go to the movie yeah. you know i mean i i'm right there with you although it's it's really going to be a fascinating time to see how we redefine uh what what is a success you know sort of i guess from a financial standpoint for a movie these days mm -hmm. if we're not getting numbers out of streaming services right like is 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 subscription like increasing subscription numbers how you determine things right. like so i was seeing that amazon was boasting that um tomorrow war was like the number one streaming movie and i'm like how do you know that yeah how, how do you know that it's not something on hbo max versus something on netflix you know right. especially uh, when they're all secretive about sharing data that, and, yeah that's what I'm saying. so it's like uh there's a lot there's a lot of change happening right now. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish you all the best with that. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to watch it as a passive observer. I'm sure it's, uh, it's quite something else to be in the thick of it. Yeah. So, good luck. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just hope for the best in terms of, I look at it as if people are talking about it, if you can go see the buzz somewhere, then maybe that's the true successful stuff, but you never know. Well, thank you so much. Um, and everyone out there, um, go tell everyone about the movie. And um, it was a real pleasure. Take yeah, care. likewise. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Take care. Take care.